heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde at Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. I'm Ed Ludlow in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full coverage of NVIDIA's annual GPU technology conference. That's as Jensen Tuang unveils its most powerful chip architecture yet. Why Blackwell will be key for the future of AI. Plus, as TikTok faces a potential ban or divestiture, we'll get the outlook on what's to come next in the Senate with US Senator Bill Haggerty from Tennessee. And we'll sit down with the CEO of the fastest growing cybersecurity company, that's Wiz, to talk M&A, valuation, so much more. But before we get to those private markets, let's get to the public ones, Ed. And we're currently seeing, look, a little bit of nervousness ahead of the all-important Fed decision tomorrow. Maybe some chips coming off the table and we try and digest really how far, how fast the Magnificent Seven, how far AI has taken us. And many saying that's a crowded trade over at Bank of America. Key for that. NASDAQ off by five tenths percent as those majors fall. But we're off of our lows. We're seeing a two-year yield. There's actually still coming down some four basis points. Generally, the macro picture has been well, still inflationary pressures. But where will we see the dot plot? That signaling from the Fed of how many rate cuts will come this year. Will it be three? Will it be two? We're seeing actually yields pull back on the two-year. Interestingly, dollar still stronger versus a Japanese yen. Finally, that era of negative interest rate policy is off the table. But will we see any rate hikes? That's certainly not being signaled thus far by the BOJ. Dollar higher versus the Japanese yen by a percentage point. Moving on, look what's happening in the world of crypto. I'm afraid from the highs come the lows, and we are going to be seeing a dialing back at the moment, down some 7%. Flash crashes happening across some exchanges. We're seeing a $62,000 handle now, Ed, and, well, we know it's always a volatile ride when it comes to crypto, but the flows into certain ETFs have been dialing back. What have you got on the micro? NVIDIA. NVIDIA is what everyone around the world is talking about. It's next generation AI accelerator, Blackwell. The stock is down more than 2%. This is a clearly sell the news kind of move. We got exactly what we thought was coming in the context of Blackwell. A lot of the focus of analysts is the performance of the Blackwell super chip, which is two GB200 Blackwell GPUs with a Grasshopper CPU. And it, they're comparing that to what NVIDIA said it can do relative to the H100, the thing we've been talking about for the last 18 months or so. This performance is better. We'll dig into it later in the program. While NVIDIA is lower, there are stocks that are pushing higher. Why? NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang name checked these names on stage at GTC on Monday night either their customers or he was praising of where they sit in the AI infrastructure build out that we're seeing around the world in the context of data centers. Dell, one of those key names moving to the upside, Caroline. Kingmaker of other stocks, perhaps not his own on the day. NVIDIA's Blackwell, though, Ed, the processor is the showcase of the chip company's GTC conference. And, and look, it extends NVIDIA's dominance, it feels like, of artificial intelligence computing. This is Hopper. Hopper changed the world. This is Blackwell. Named after the mathematician and game theorist David Blackwell, this new platform is multiple times superior at AI models and inference that its predecessor, Hopper, as we can see, he's just lining them up next to each other a moment. Let's break it all down with Antoine Skyman is technology infrastructure analyst at New Street Research, who covers NVIDIA and AI. And the dominance has been clear when you're looking at a market capitalization, when you're thinking of the trillion dollars added in market cap this year alone. Did it live up to the third most, well, valuable company in the world? Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Caroline. I'd say our, our main takeaways from Jensen's keynote uh, yesterday is that the competitiveness of NVIDIA's products is only getting stronger. Uh, Blackwell, the new platform that the company announced, offers up to four times higher training performance and 30 times higher inference performance than its predecessor, Hopper. And so next time you hear someone announce a chip that's 10 times faster than NVIDIA, remember that a year later, NVIDIA will also have a chip 10 times faster. So alternatives to NVIDIA can have an advantage that lasts at best one generation, and a year later, that advantage goes away. And last but not least, remember that this advantage often comes at a cost. First, giving up on the flexibility that GPUs offer, 
And second, the cost of not being able to leverage NVIDIA's ecosystem. So I would say that, yes, it lives up. Antoine, there was a lot more emphasis from Jensen on, on inference than there has been historically, right? The story was around the role H100 played in training large language models with, with many tens or hundreds of billions of parameters. Are you convinced that, that if we're in a world where we move from more training to more inference, NVIDIA continues to lead in that side of the market as well? Yes, I, I think so. And uh, I think Jensen clearly illustrated that very well. Inference is a very complex problem that involves uh, very complex optimization, uh, where you have to parallelize a workload across dozens of GPUs. And uh, I think what uh, Jensen showed yesterday is that uh, NVIDIA's moat is really about uh, being able to optimize these GPUs to solve that complex inference problem very efficiently. This 30 times better than Hopper clearly illustrates that, uh, that NVIDIA is very, very much delivering on that front. What were you most excited about from Jensen, right? He's like being compared to Steve Jobs. He's the man of the moment. He wears his leather jacket. Are you convinced by all the things that he says about the future when he's on stage? I think I was most excited about uh, innovation beyond just GPUs. Um, if you look at the fact that NVIDIA also announced material improvements for secondary chips, like the gray CPU, the DPU, various yeah. networking chips, um, we actually can conclude that only half the performance improvement is coming from the GPU. And the other half is actually coming from the, the rest of the hardware stack uh, and system level integration. So bottom line is that NVIDIA's mode is not just about designing great GPUs, it's about designing great, great systems uh, optimized to unleash fully the capabilities of those GPUs. And I think that's really what I was uh, excited about when I looked at the keynote yesterday. And it's clearly perhaps why we're seeing some impact on rival chip companies. I mean, AMD is, I think, one of the worst performers on the day. Does this mean that they've got it all locked up? Or is with the new paradigm shift to inference and the fact some of these hyperscalers themselves want to be making their own chips, does that longer term provide some sort of competitive issue? Well, I think uh, that NVIDIA's competition will thrive as well because demand is so strong at the moment. So uh, everybody will continue to buy as much as they can, uh, at least until the end of next year. Mm. Um, and that doesn't mean that they will challenge the dominance of NVIDIA, but that will make room for alternatives. So at this point in time, we actually see upside in both NVIDIA and AMD. Uh, but the uncertainty that there is beyond 2025 um, means that the risk-reward ratio is getting thinner and thinner uh, as those stocks keep having a, a run. Uh, what happens beyond 2025, I think nobody knows. It will depend on the performance of next generation, larger models, uh, as well as adoption and monetization of AI. Um, but I would say that there is room for for challengers like AMD to to also gain a lot of share in that market. Probably in the 10 to 20 percent region is something we would see as reasonable. I want to just dwell on the supply side issues a little bit because packaging is something that's being highlighted time and time again. Are we ultimately going to see an issue never with demand, it feels like, but just how much can be made, how quickly it can be made and how and who buy? So I think um, demand is really, you know, something that uh, we'll have to, to, to look at. We'll have to look at many, many dimensions. We are on the lookout, you know, observing the industry on all fronts. And so we'll definitely keep you posted. I don't think at this stage anyone um, can determine what's going to happen beyond 2025. Between now and 2025, though, we have very strong visibility. Uh, all data points suggest um, that NVIDIA uh, is going to do very well, AMD is going to do very well, Broadcom is going to do very well. We see the industry shaping up, you know, uh, supply, um, COAS capacity, for instance, uh, doubling again this year. I think all the data points suggest that everything is going to remain strong until 2025, but there is no way to determine what happens beyond 2025 yet. We'll have to monitor leading indicators uh, on that front, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like uh, uh, adoption and monetization of AI. I love Caroline's question because uh, Blackwell has 208 billion transistors in the Tensor Core, right? It's so many transistors, it's actually two chips in a multi-die format. TSMC is going to be the manufacturer making them. 
for MP technique. Just something you said, Antoine, I think the forecast in fiscal 25 is $110 billion of revenue up from 61 in fiscal 24. Do you have a good sense of how quickly um, Blackwell will be revenue generating? I think they said it will be launching later this year, calendar year. Yes, I mean, when you look at NVIDIA's prior cycles, uh, for instance, Hopper that launched in late 2022 represented maybe mid single digits of sales uh, and mostly in the fourth quarter. Uh, and that quickly ramped uh, in 2023, um, maybe to uh, about half of sales. And so we, we expect probably a similar trajectory to, to play out uh, for, uh, for Blackwell. All right, New Street Research Analyst Antoine Schreiber, great to have you on the program reacting to the event of the year, probably, so far. Now, coming up, we're going to bring you the latest on the other big story, the TikTok divest or ban bill, and why tech critics are saying Congress needs to think a lot bigger. That conversation is next. Caroline, another chip mover. Yeah, and let's go back to the AI hype, Ed, because, well... We're seeing supply coming into action for super microcomputer. We're down by 11%. Why? Because they're offering to sell more shares, 2 million more shares in a public offering that could raise as much as $2 billion. Remember, this computer server maker has been on an absolute tear, Ed, a 1,000% gain amid this way AI enthusiasm over the last 12 months. It's going to be giving up a little bit as we see them sell more shares. This is Bloomberg Technology. officials from the Justice Department and other agencies. Now, they're going to be holding closed-door briefings in the Senate this week to advance legislation that would allow TikTok to continue its U.S. operations while being severed from its Chinese owner. Now, this is all as briefings are likely to be held today and tomorrow, we understand. This is an ongoing lobbying battle, isn't it, over the divest or ban TikTok bill as it moves to the Senate after what was a very quick passage in the House last week. I just sat down with Republican Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee to get his thoughts on the legislation earlier today. Just take a listen. Well, it's hard to say what's going to happen in the Senate because Chuck Schumer controls the pace of play in the Senate and it's got to move through the Commerce Committee uh, and that gavel is controlled by Maria Cantwell. Uh, so I'm not certain what the pace will be. But I can tell you what the concerns are regarding the bill. I think the bill is trying to address a very real concern that has to do with the national security laws of China. And any company that is Chinese-owned is subject to their data being surveilled by the Chinese Communist Party. There are no exceptions to that rule. And that's data collected wherever it may be collected around the world, including in America. The concern that this bill is trying to get at is the concern about the privacy of Americans' data and a desire not to allow that data to be surveilled by the Chinese Communist Party. That's a very real concern. There's also another concern that's being very clearly articulated as well. Uh, the last thing that we want to see happen is more power shift to the hands of companies like Meta that have demonstrated a willingness to censor American voices, particularly conservative American voices. So I think what we're talking about here is who owns TikTok at the end of the day and whether a divestiture can be achieved. So you'd want TikTok to remain as a competitor here in the United States, just under different ownership? And, and I think that, that is exactly what the bill contemplates. We'll see again what the final product looks like as it moves to the Senate, but that's what I would expect to see. There has been some heavy lobbying, shall we say, coming from TikTok on the Hill. And it was notable that almost the person who first got the ball rolling on analyzing the ownership of TikTok and indeed its persistence here in the US was former President Trump. And then he changed his opinion. He went more on the concern around Meta. Do you think that was to do with lobbying? What do you think changed his mind? I, I really doubt it has anything to do with lobbying. I think it probably has a lot more to do with what we saw come out in the X-Files in the Twitter tapes uh, and the degree of censorship that's taking place between the Biden administration and companies like Meta and Meta's willingness to get involved in elections. Uh, I think everybody was deeply surprised and shocked with the suppression of the story about Hunter Biden that was suppressed from the New York Post, uh, the degree by which you know, this government, certainly this White House, has been, quote, flagging a uh, post of concern to them. And that all feels like censorship to most Americans. I think that's the point, that's the concern that President Trump is highlighting. What, to go the other route and many people feeling that what they don't want to see happen is a lack of freedom of speech, a lack of an ability to use this platform. So if it was to remain in the United States, who should own it? Who should be a buyer? 
Well, I certainly prefer an American tone it, um, and that's the needle I think this legislation is trying to thread right now. Should it be a social media company? Should it be individual investors? I know that your background is, is such. Well, it's going to be a large price tag, I feel pretty certain. So uh, it's hard to predict, and nor do I think legislation should dictate um, you know, who that buyer might ultimately be. But we'll see what happens. Should a ban or divestment on TikTok be significant to the U.S. public? Well, I think it would be quite significant because of the number of users. I think the count is 170 million users. Uh, of, of TikTok. So I think there's a great interest in what happens here. And again, the Congress is trying to thread the needle on balancing our security concerns and our concerns about data privacy with concerns of free speech. Have you received calls from people within your within Tennessee wanting to see that TikTok remains, not wanting to see it go? We've received calls on both sides. Ah. And and so it's it's hard to say where the American public lies on this. I haven't seen polling on it. But again, I think the, the concerns are, 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 are both very real. Again, the national security concern that our data would be exposed to surveillance by the Chinese Communist Party, even weaponization by the Chinese Communist Party. That's something Americans clearly don't want. That's what I'm hearing. But also a concern that we not put too much power in the hands of those large media companies that have shown their desire and their willingness to censor particularly conservative voices here in America. So threading that needle is where this legislation needs to go. The Republican take from Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee giving his thoughts on a TikTok bill as it begins potentially to slowly move through the Senate. And, well, let's just look at some of the overall concerns, the opponents, the tech critics, the, the issue around Congress about thinking that it more broadly should not just be a divest or ban legislation on TikTok, but perhaps broader privacy could tell, well, privacy oversight coming to every single social media platform. Alex Brinker is here, and I think that was kind of what Bill Haggerty was trying to get at here. The senator, Alex, was that, well, as many Republicans might try to articulate, they've been concerned with other social media platforms and their voice within. Should there just be a broader privacy oversight here, a broader law, rather than just targeting one individual company? That's what's been so interesting about this, Caroline, what Senator Haggerty kind of laid out to you, that they're concerned about data privacy as the impetus for this bill. Uh, some folks are looking at that saying, we actually need to go bigger. This bill itself is not about data privacy in the language. It's about ownership and ownership by uh, foreign adversaries like China. We talked to experts for a story coming out in this latest edition of Business Week magazine, and they are saying, look, why don't we think bigger about this and not just focus on one company or one country, but actually set fe federal data privacy regulations in the U.S., which the U.S. doesn't have. I chatted to folks uh, at Epic, like Callie Schroeder, who's their general counsel. Epic's an organization who has been lobbying for a broader privacy regulation for a while. And she had a really great comparison. She basically said, look, if the internet is a colander, then plugging TikTok, plugging one hole is the equivalent of this TikTok bill. It's one small hole in the data ecosystem. And Americans' data is slipping out elsewhere. So why don't we address this on a broader scale? Alex, I think it's important to go back to what you and I reported last week and basically point out TikTok is not promising to divest at all. The opposite. They're kind of digging in and saying, we've put forward a, a user data solution that we're going to stick with. And listening to Caroline's interview just then, there seems to be the political group that say, this is just about TikTok, ownership of TikTok. And then there's the group that says, this is much bigger. It's about censorship uh, via social media platforms and a blanket control by government. Which voice is loudest right now? It's a mix of both. And to take you a little bit behind the scenes with our reporting over the last 48 hours, we know that the Department of Justice is briefing senators this week, uh, encouraging them to vote for this bill. And also TikTok is passing out a one pager that I was able to review, batting down some of those concerns uh, on data privacy in particular. The DOJ is pointing out that TikTok collects names, addresses, phone numbers. And TikTok is saying, look, that's the same kind of information that any other social media company, particularly the ones that might be lobbying them, like Meta and, uh, and X and the like, those other rivals collect the same amount of data. And Ed, when I rewind and think about the social media industry, it is not lacking for infractions when it comes to user data getting out. What has been lacking, though, is actual legislation. We've seen the CEOs of these companies come through for hearing after hearing. Think about Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg, how many times he's arrived on the Hill to talk about this stuff. Uh, but we have yet to see any kind 
kind of data privacy regulation. And that's why folks like Democrat Mark Pocan or Elizabeth Warren have in the past few days said, look, we like some of the ideas behind this bill. We think we need to be protecting American users' data. But let's set up an actual framework that, that does that holistically and doesn't just target one company in a bill that the language of it could actually be uh, deemed illegal, as TikTok will probably take this to a legal fight if this passes. I always think it's worth saying out loud, it is a divest or ban bill, not a big picture sweeping piece of social media regulation. Bloomberg's Alex Barinka, terrific reporting. Thank you. Now, coming up on the show, Reddit gears up for its initial public offering this week. We're going to break down what to expect in our conversation next. We'll be right back. This is Bloomberg Technology. Social platform Reddit gearing up for its IPO this week. For more on what we can expect from the listing, let's bring in Bloomberg Managing Editor Lynn Doan. And, and Lynn, it's this week. We've been wasting years. Uh, what's on your desk this week and what are you looking for? I mean, I'll give you an idea of what we are expecting here on the news side. A, a lot of details dropped earlier this week. We know that Reddit and some of its uh, existing stakeholders are, are planning on selling a total of 22 million shares of that total. 15 million shares are expected to be sold by the company itself, and they see them going for as much as $34 each. At the top range of that, Reddit could end up with a market value of $5.4 billion, making it what I think would be the biggest IPO so far this year. But you never know what's going to happen with these things. And we're told the IPO will price tomorrow and start trading the day after. So that'll be the big moment of truth. Yeah. I mean, moment of truth also in the final innings, in comes Nokia with some legal patent issues. Yeah, I mean, that surprised us all a little bit um, to see that come. Then again, I was I was talking to a colleague about it earlier this morning and uh, and I thought, gosh, all these headwinds are hitting so close to the IPO. But at the same time, we were thinking, oh, yeah, but this is also the moment when companies tend to, you know, yeah. drag all the skeletons out of the closet and disclose everything up front and say, you know, you need to know what you're um, what you're in, in, in store for if you decide to invest in our company. I mean, in my mind, that patent infringement complaint from Nokia yeah. is something to watch. It's definitely worth watching. I don't think the company right. would have disclosed it um, if it wasn't material. Uh, that being said, I think also um, I have to leave it Nokia. there, I'm afraid, Linda. And sorry to cut you off. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here in San Francisco. Great to have you back, Ed. I'm Caroline Hyde in New York. Let's have a quick check on these markets, shall we? Because, look, we've actually been selling off ahead of the Federal Reserve meeting and announcement tomorrow. But Nasdaq 100 currently off by six-tenths of a percent. So big tech under pressure as we basically take some profits. This is a crowded trade, according to Bank of America. One of the most crowded trade is the Magnificent Seven. And, of course, after NVIDIA's all-important tech event is upon us, the Woodstock of developers conferences maybe there's just a little bit of chips off the table the dollar still strengthening it's particularly the japanese yen as they end their policy of negative interest rates we're up more than a percentage point and of course we still anticipate where the federal reserve will go in terms of their own rate hikes or cuts later in the year bitcoin currently off by almost seven percent let's call it certainly seeing some concerns about the inflows into the etfs at the moment now i want to shine a light on what's happening over at tencent because we've got their numbers coming out wednesday still off by 1.4 percent interesting u.s China tension still bubbling over with TikTok, but Tencent actually could show us some margin improvement, even if we don't see revenue improvement. Keep an eye on that key name traded here in the US. Of course, it's USDRs there at the moment. Cadence Design up 1.7%. I want to shine a light on some of the companies that perhaps as NVIDIA doesn't rally, we do see some other companies being singled out as using NVIDIA's Blackwell going forward. Ansys, Cadence Design, Synopsis among them. So AMD, though, on the downside, some 7%. As look, that competition, it's getting so tough as NVIDIA just shows its dominance within the world of training and inference. But Ed, I want to get your take on the dominance and what really Blackwell, the, the whole scope of offerings that was being articulated by Jensen Wang. What did you make of it? 
Well, it's just a numbers game that it's a different technology, right? So when we talk about the GB200, it is actually two GPUs combined with one CPU, two Blackwell GPUs, one Grasshopper CPU. But those numbers on the screen tell the story that they've just upped the performance levels. And in aggregate, as we scale more data center infrastructure, the bottom point's really important that it's just much more energy efficient. Yeah. When you put the Blackwell into a cluster, you get 25 times power efficiency, which, you know, in the context of, of the environment and climate, is important as well. And when we think about well, the Hopper offering and indeed the H100 is, what, 30,000, 40,000 per one. And when you're thinking of the amount that each hyperscale is having to invest in, the numbers rack up. We haven't got any sort of price point for Blackwell, but. Ultimately, when you're thinking of the power offset you can get, it just shows the amount that power is going to be costing for these data centers. Yeah, because it's just it's easy for Jensen Huang to hold up two GPUs or tentacles in his hands. The reality is that Blackwell will sh uh, ship as a rack or server design uh, and go into banks of racks in a data center. The scale is just enormous. Um, and the power consumption relates to that. We're talking about hundreds of uh, square miles of, of space with many hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, these Blackwell GPUs going into what it, NVIDIA calls a supercomputer, yeah. but it's basically a server farm. <laughs> it's all about the terminology. And I have to say, I loved reading your Tech Daily newsletter yesterday because you really made it so straightforward for us there. Meanwhile, let's stick with how straightforward AI or isn't right now, particularly for the IT leaders. And we really got to also think about more broadly where it's being applied in across industry groups. It's front and center, in fact, in terms of the conversation that was being had this morning on Bloomberg Surveillance. They were live from Bank of America trading floor. Take a listen. The way we're looking at how AI changes um, virtually everything we do. We never would have been able to do these indicators five, ten years ago. We didn't have the capability of aggregating all this data together. Now that you have access that only data scientists and quants used to have, you actually can use intelligence straight from your smartphone, leveraging all of those ways. We're looking at 69 million accounts. That's a lot of data. That's not yeah. sending somebody a survey in the mail and getting them to respond. Real-time data on 69 million accounts. And I think this is a wonderful thing about AI. That's what you're seeing right now. You're seeing the chips, the servers, those are being bought and those are being deployed. I think Euphoria is really uh, driven by themes at this point. So it's AI. Everybody owns the, the AI plays. Oh, everyone's talking about it. And a few people are worrying about how much they've got to up their sophistication and understanding of it, particularly IT leaders right now. Let's dig into how AI is changing every industry, every business with Paige Costello, head of AI at Asana. It's an enterprise work management platform. And you just put out a state of IT report, really, which I'm sure you're going to a few optimistic but also slightly fretful IT leaders across every industry group thinking, how am I suddenly the AI leader and expert and how do I deploy this? Yes, absolutely. 77% of CIOs and IT leaders believe that they are personally responsible for the intelligent transformation. And that that is a high bar and it's creating a lot of stress and pressure for IT leaders. Paige, on stage, Jensen Huang last night talked about this new age of computing. And when we talk about computer, you know, I grew up with a Dell desktop with a keyboard. I think we're talking about something completely different. Do you think that your customers and everyone that you work with kind of watches that NVIDIA keynote and thinks, my goodness, I need to start hiring people that know what he's talking about so that we know what we're talking about? <laughs> yes, I do think with this uh, big change in work, people are going to be hiring for new roles and the existing teammates are trying to figure out how do I use AI to be a more effective player. And so one of the most wonderful things that we're observing is the excitement, anticipation for what AI can do, but also some level of fear because there's real curiosity of can we add one more thing here? Can we actually ask and make demands of our teams to use yet another app? And so that's one of the, the contentious zones right now is AI isn't always built in and ready to use. Are the people available that, 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 are, that are needed? Yeah, I would, what I think is most amazing is that it's not 
necessarily actually about the people. What's most important is that the technology supports the people in what they're trying to achieve. So I work at Asana. Asana is an enterprise work management platform that serves 80% of the Fortune 100, helping them drive clarity and accountability at scale. And what's quite compelling is actually putting AI in the hands of the team and in the hands of executives to answer really normal questions like, what's the progress of our strategic initiatives? How do I break this work down and reason about it so we can actually get it done? And how do we connect workflows across our work data to make decisions about what to do next and how to stay agile in this competitive environment? Are some of the IT executives and others in leadership you're talking to worried they're having to be too agile right now? Yeah, actually one in four IT leaders says they moved a little too fast on AI and they're fretful about making technology selections. Okay, so let's use best in practice. I'm an IT leader at you know healthcare company. How do I ensure that I've got everyone underneath me singing from the same hymn sheet, wanting to do the same thing with the AI tools that I'm thinking of deploying. How are you seeing that being enacted at the moment? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is data connectivity and the access to the data, because AI is only as good as the data you feed it. Right now, many AI solutions are effectively islands that require entrepreneurial employees to figure out how to use them and how to apply and create value for their team and for their company. There's no top level connectivity around strategy and what's important to the organization. And so that's where the gap is. You can't sing from the same song sheet if you don't know what the plan is and how to execute it. And AI needs that knowledge too. AI needs to know how do you want to get work done? And that's where quite a bit of the gap is. So what I would say is for CIOs and strategic leaders, and in the example you gave, it's first about data and connectivity, and then it's about safe and secure rollout that's mindful and cognizant of your goals as an organization. Asana, head of AI, Paige Castillo, great to have you on the program. Thank you. Another story that we're watching, chip makers are racing to feed the growing global AI boom, and Samsung is laying down the gauntlet with a new research lab dedicated to designing an entirely new type of semiconductor, which is needed for artificial general intellig intelligence, or AGI. It's a long-standing aspiration in AI development. The company's trying to catch up with SK Hynix after the smaller competitor got a head start in a new type of advanced memory semiconductor tailored for the use with NVIDIA's chips. Cara. NVIDIA's chips everywhere in our conversation today. Meanwhile, well, let's go from AI to cyber. And look, let's face it, cyber is being focused on in AI as well. We sit down with the CEO of fast-growing cybersecurity startup Wiz to discuss everything, M&A to the cloud. As Saf Rappaport's with us. This is Bloomberg Technology. for VC Spotlight, we've got to shine a light on the fast-growing cybersecurity startup, Wiz. It's already raised more than $900 million from investors and is now said to be making, well, some more acquisitions in the space, potentially. We, of course, know that it's been buying Gem Security for $350 million. Joining us now to discuss the state of cybersecurity, the company's rapid growth, Wiz CEO, Asaf Rappaport. And Asaf, it's been what feels like a whirlwind to everyone else. For you, a grind of someone who is a serial entrepreneur, who has seen companies bought, got inside Microsoft, come outside of Microsoft, building a Microsoft competitor. How do you show, what, what, what has made Wiz so successful since you launched in COVID? So but basically, again, we have a journey ahead of us to be truly successful, looking towards an IPO, billion dollar in revenues. So, it's just the beginning for us. Having said that, you talked about the tailwind, and I think that the cyber market is definitely exploding. When we're looking at the global markets, we're seeing that you know, this is like the ultimate election year. 50% of the population of the, of the world is going to election, definitely here in the US. The geopolitical crisis that we're seeing are rising. AI introduces a new attack surface, but both like cyber criminals are leveraging the, that, that. All of that pushes for more and more you know, a uh, need for cybersecurity tools. Definitely we look at uh, 2023. Unfortunately, 2023, we had like more than 3,200 uh, reported data breaches in the world. This is the peak that we had. And 2024, unfortunately, doesn't look better. So definitely there is a huge demand. And when you're addressing this demand, a huge market demand and a, a huge market TAM, and you build a simple solution 
for a complex problem, that gives you some of the tailwind that we had. And that tailwind evidenced by some of the numbers that were made public last year of the 350 million run rate. That, of course, helps you guide towards an IPO and a valuation. But you're also looking at M&A to beef up ahead of initial public offering. What sort of companies do you need to add at this moment rather than organic growth? Yeah, definitely organic growth is our core uh, focus and definitely kind of innovation we're doing organically. Having said that, and it's not only related to Wiz, if you're looking at the last six months, $2 billion of acquisitions in the cybersecurity space, lots of them, by the way, in, in, in Israel, by four leaders, Palo, Alto Networks, CrowdStrike, Zscaler, and Wiz. So definitely we're seeing that non-organic opportunities are there. When we're looking at the market, definitely threat detection, CDR, super important for us to grow. When we're looking at AI, definitely another focus area for us. But also if you, if you shift left, like looking more in the developers and code security, mm -hmm. this is a focus for us. So definitely we believe that 2024 for us is going to be a, the year of acquisitions. Uh, Asaf, good morning from San Francisco. The Financial Times reported on March 8th that you were raising more money at a valuation above $10 billion. I remember a year ago, there were lots of reports you were raising money at $10 billion valuation. And then again in May in the summer, just clarify for our audience, are you raising money and at what valuation? <laughs> Look, to, to ask a CEO of a startup, are you raising money? It's probably always true. I do it true. every so, day. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, so not every day. And definitely our focus is on building technology and attracting the best talent. So that's kind of our focus. Having said that, I would say that there is a lot of interest. Like our, our new publication of Dali, the COO and president of Zscaler, joining with the publication of $350 million in revenues, the publication of 40% of the Fortune 100 are using Wiz uh, today and the exploding of cybersecurity attracts a lot of attention to, to Wiz. We enjoy it, but uh, again, when we have something to, to publish, we'll definitely share it here in Bloomberg. Uh, Asaf, let's go to where the value lays. What is it from a technology perspective that's unique to Wiz relative to your, your competitors? I think that what's, if you look at what, what Wiz is doing, basically what we're doing is helping organization to protect everything they run and build in their cloud. And the cloud environment is one of the most complex uh, environments in the world. You know, te new technologies are thriving there. It's not only centralized by IT or security, it's led by developers and DevOps. So definitely this is poses like new challenges uh, to organizations. And with that kind of, we need a new approach. I think that we're seeing like legacy companies that have like super good like technology in network security or in endpoint security, but definitely you need like the cloud security company. And I think organizations now understand that, that you cannot solve with legacy solution, new problems, and definitely invest in kind of the new initiative uh, in cloud security. Asaf, in that vein then, what is the biggest tailwind to, to Wiz, but also the industry, right? What is the headwind to companies that need to spend on security right now, cybersecurity? I, I definitely think that the tailwind, and definitely in cloud security, is probably AI. And we're talking a lot about that. So AI introduces not only kind of, I, I think, like two new challenges in a way. One is, is definitely it's a new attack surface. If you're looking at like the prompt, the AI pipeline, the, the data that you're using in AI, the models that you're using, all of that is net new attack surface for organizations. So that's one focus area. But it's not only that. It's also AI that is being leveraged by cyber criminal, criminals. Actually, to be honest, they're doing a better job probably leveraging Gen AI today in their attacks and fueling their attacks than us as the defenders using it for our RBF. So definitely this is an, an, a great opportunity for us to use this technology and to leverage into the cyber defenders. What's the hardest part of your job right now? Oh, the hardest is always, since the beginning, is attracting the best talent. Right. Like the, the company and you, you, can, you can put technology, IP, even customer, it's all about eventually, it's all, always get to the talent. You know, we're talking, we, you know, we, we, we raised $900 million, we're expanding, we're about to, to recruit 400 people in the US in, the, in 2024. To find amazing 400 people, that's a truly tough job. And then you, you're based here now in New York, yeah. so they could be New York people for 400 or uh, everywhere? So we're a global company, definitely focused on the, on the US market. New York is kind of our headquarters, so definitely lots of focus uh, here. But we have an Austin office, we have, we have a DC office, we have a huge presence in, in, in California. So definitely in the US, but also globally. I think that 
you know, unlike other markets, cloud, for example, and cloud security, you know, it's not like, hey, EMEA or APAC are following the US. In some fronts, they're actually more advanced than us here in the US. Well, I'm sure that's enough to keep you up at night. We thank you so much. We're CEO Asaf Rappaport. And hopefully we'll have him back when he can articulate just what the valuation is soon enough and how much they're always seemingly raising. We thank him so much. Coming up, our conversation with Google's chief health officer about how the company is using AI to connect people to health information. That's next. This is Bloomberg Technology. Google has just announced a slew of initiatives to deploy its artificial intelligence models in healthcare in particular. Now that includes a tool that will help Fitbit users glean insights from their wearable devices and a partnership to improve screenings for cancer and disease over in India. We caught up with Google's chief health officer, Dr. Karen DeSalvo, just moments ago. Take a listen. Such an exciting time in healthcare because AI has reached this inflection point where it is now capable of being an adjunct, an assistant to augmenting the work that doctors and nurses and other people in healthcare already need to do and extending the, the reach of clinical practice to, to improve access to care. Sometimes I'm very jealous of doctors that are just starting out um, in the field because they have this new tool in their toolbox that they're gonna get to use across their career in the way that when penicillin was discovered, it was a new tool in the toolbox. So we're already seeing that um, AI is helpful in, in improving speed to diagnosis. For example, we're, we're doing some work with Apollo hospitals in India to extend the ability of, the, of that health system to diagnose cancers earlier, like lung and breast cancer, so that they can reach people who normally wouldn't have that kind of access to care. So thinking about how it's a wonderful augment to the work that needs to happen in clinical practice and makes that practice more efficient, uh, but also gives people more access to it. It's a really exciting opportunity. Can you articulate some of the ways in which Google in particular is able to use its own innovations, its own products that it's already brought into the field to be able to help with health. We talked a lot about these at the checkup, which is an annual event where we can mark the progress of how things are going and how we're working with partners, but also how we're directly helping consumers. I'll give you an example of how we're building it directly into some of our products and to work with consumers. So on Fitbit, where people already get advice about steps or sleep or nutrition, we're creating what's called a personal large language model. So we're, we're creating a new AI that's personalized to you so that it know with your consent, knows your sleep and your steps and sort of other characteristics about your day and your exercise and can give you personal coaching that gives you those nudges that are gonna matter most to you because it's reflective of what your experience has. I'm personally very excited about this also. I'm a person who's a runner and it's really, it'll be so exciting to have that personal AI coach built into our watch device devices like Fitbit um, over time and pretty soon we're going to allow people to start to opt in to help us build and, and mature that, that personal LLM. Dr. Karen DeSalvo, Chief Health Officer at Google. Ed, what have you got? Time for Talking Tech. And in the news, first up, Shopback, an online shopping rewards app backed by Temasek, is cutting about a quarter of its workforce as it retreats from the buy now, pay later space. The CEO says the company is eliminating 24% of staff to become more focused and self-sustainable. Plus, GoTo plans to buy back as much as $200 million of stock after recording its first ever profit on an adjusted basis. The stock buyback is the first ever for GoTo, which hopes to stoke investor confidence even as competition intensifies. And George Lucas, the legendary Hollywood filmmaker, said he would support Disney CEO Bob Iger in his proxy battle with activist investors. Lucas became a significant shareholder years ago when he sold his production company to Disney. And in a statement this morning, he says he has, quote, full faith and confidence in the power of Disney and Bob's track record driving long-term value. Caro, the force is with Bob Iger. <laughs> And I'm very pleased to say that we're in full force with you back as well, Ed. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. All right, don't forget to check out the pod. Thank you so much to those that are listening to the podcast all around the world. Apple, Spotify, iHeart and all the Bloomberg platforms. This is Bloomberg.